In this lesson, we define inertia and look at Newton's first law of motion. At the heart of classical mechanics are Newton's three laws of motion. Written over 300 years ago, we used them to fly to the moon and we've used them to steer probes to the planets. Let's have a look at the first law called the law of inertia. Here we have a book sitting at rest on a desk. Remove the desk and the book accelerates to the ground. It accelerates to the ground because the book has mass. It is pulled towards the earth. Mass is a measure of the inertia of the book. A free body diagram of the book shows all the forces acting on the book. More on free body diagrams later. But here's our free body diagram of the book. Without the desk, there's only one force acting on the book, the force of gravity, and the book accelerates towards the ground. Put the desk back and the free body diagram changes. Now the desk pushes up on the book and we call this the normal force. And the normal force here is equal in magnitude to the force of gravity. The forces are balanced. And we take different objects and try this out. And we start getting a look at Newton's first law. So we make generalizations and so far we have, if an object is at rest, then the forces acting on it must be balanced. We mentioned a new term here, inertia, and we talked about how mass is a measure of this physical quantity called inertia. To illustrate what inertia is, we're going to look at uh, two examples here, two objects sliding along an ice surface. Uh, one is a hockey puck of mass m, and the other is a curling stone of mass 100 m. Our hockey puck. Hockey puck or curling stone traveling at the same velocity, which one's most difficult to bring to a stop? Our curling stone. So this is inertia, uh, a measure of the object's resistance to a change in its velocity. So back to the question, which one's most difficult to stop, the curling stone or the puck? I think you'd likely predict that it's the stone that's more difficult to stop. And the stone is more difficult to stop because it has more inertia. It is 100 times the mass of the puck. It has 100 times the inertia of the puck. You thought you were good at air hockey? Bet you can't beat this one. Michael, can you tell us about uh, this robot over here in the corner? Sure, sure. This is the Nuvation Air Hockey Bot 1000. Uh, so this is a robot that we built that plays air hockey against a human. And uh, it's fascinating to see uh, humans uh, play against the robot. It's very engaging. It's very much a Terminator, uh, a deep thought uh, kind of thing. In order to see uh, the two competing against each other, the humans get amazingly engaged in the game. Well, what kind of sensors does this thing operate off of? Sure. So uh, above the table, um, there's a video camera. Um, with uh, uh, lights that are uh, blinking at very high frequency um, and every nine milliseconds it captures the status of the game. And so we can see the, the puck and there's actually a, a reflective strip on the top of the puck that's a rectangle so it can tell the puck uh, XY location and also the puck spin. Um, the robot then uh, projects where the puck's going. So over my shoulder here there's a number of screens that shows uh, where the robot is predicting the puck's going to go. So it can predict up to three bounces in advance, incorporating spin and everything of where the puck's going to go. And so it's fascinating to watch them play against some of the best players in the world because they're used to being able to very precisely put the puck just to one side of the net and the robot will sit there very stoically and completely ignore it because it knows uh, that it's not going to score. Um, and then based on its percent of confidence of how the puck is modeling against uh, its trajectory, it'll then venture out and become increasingly aggressive uh, depending on its percent confidence. Um, sometimes it plays defensively, sometimes it'll venture out, be much more aggressive, and shoot the puck back towards the opponent's goal. So when an object is at rest, the forces on it must be balanced. What happens for objects that are traveling at constant velocity? So here we have an air puck on a table traveling at constant velocity. We'll consider no friction here, and let's have a look at the free body diagram. So the forces acting on the puck are again force of gravity pulling down and the, the 
the desktop pushing up on the puck, those forces are equal in magnitude, opposite in direction. So the forces on the puck are balanced, and we say there is zero net force on the puck. So in this case, we have balanced forces again, but our object is not at rest. It is traveling at constant velocity. So now we've got a more uh, general explanation or description of Newton's law of inertia, Newton's first law, and it goes like this. The physics book sitting on the desk at rest, no unbalanced force. The puck on the air table traveling along at constant velocity, again, no unbalanced force or forces were balanced. So here we have Newton's law of inertia. An object will remain at rest or continue to move at constant velocity unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. Much of Voyager 1's propulsion system came from employment of Newton's laws and using planets to slingshot it through the solar system. It has now left the solar system and has long since depleted its propulsion systems. Running on battery power for communications, it'll run out of power in about uh, 20 years and it continues following Newton's first law of motion. Traveling at more than 50,000 kilometers per hour, it'll continue traveling at constant velocity until it comes within the gravitational field of our solar system's nearest star and that's going to be another 20,000 years. Let's summarize the main points in this lesson. One, we defined inertia and, and said it was a measure of how difficult it is to change the velocity of an object. And then we examine Newton's first law of motion, which is the law of inertia, and that is an object will continue at constant velocity unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. And remember, at rest is a constant velocity of zero. Oh, a little sloppy here. Summary. Let's correct that. All right, let's try a practice problem here. And we'll get your viewers in a position where you can pause them and try this question. So the question goes like this. Uh, which one of the following, uh, we're going to change that to is correct. Which one of the following statements is correct? And A says, an unbalanced force on an object will always change the object's speed. B, if there is no net force on an object, then it must be at rest. And C states, an unbalanced force on an object will always change the object's direction of motion. And finally, D, if an object is slowing down, then there must be an unbalanced force acting on it. Let's pause your viewer and try this question. Always is an important word and we'll highlight that. Well, we know an unbalanced force will always change the object's velocity, but you could have the speed or the magnitude part of velocity staying the same, but direction changing. Circular motion is an example and we'll look at circular motion later. And choice C is out for the same reason that A is out. Again, Newton's first law says if we have an unbalanced force, our velocity is definitely going to change. But there's two ways of changing velocity, changing its magnitude or changing its direction. And of course, we discussed a couple examples where there's no net force on an object but it could be moving at constant velocity, and that certainly is consistent with Newton's first law. So that leaves D, and of course D it is. If an object is slowing down, then of course it is accelerating, its velocity is changing, and therefore there must be an unbalanced force acting on it. Newton's first law. And our second practice problem. Which one of the following quantities is used to quantify the inertia of an object? Velocity, mass, kinetic energy, or weight? Pause your viewer and try this question. Remember, inertia is the resistance to change in motion. So an object that has a lot of inertia, it's difficult to change its motion. And the quantity that measures inertia is mass. Our answer is B. 
Remember, weight is the force due to gravity measured in newtons, quite different than mass.